Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast. I am Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Today, Craig and I continue our jaunts through England, and we have finally made it to the RSE, the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh, that was the most horrible accent ever. <laughs> but first, let's do some theater folk news. So, this podcast goes out on a Wednesday, and this particular Wednesday is June 26th, so we are in the thick of our week at the International Thespian Festival. And if you're standing in Lincoln, listening to your iPod, listening to me, talking to you on your iPod, and you haven't made it over to the vendor area yet, get over here. We've got free electronic catalogs with free resources. We have free monologue CDs for students, 20 guys and 20 girl monologues, all free. And we're giving away free scripts to those who come up to the table with the daily secret password, which is posted each day on the Theater Folk Facebook page. And if you're not in Lincoln, I'm done talking about it. So you can breathe a sigh of relief. Phew. Lastly, where or oh, where can you get this podcast? We post new episodes every Wednesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on the Stitcher app and you can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search on the word, what is it? Ah, yes, Theater Folk. Episode 47. Is it worth it to see the understudy? So... When Craig and I talked about what theater we wanted to see when we took our trip to England, going to Stratford-on-Avon and seeing something at the Royal Shakespeare Company was certainly on the list. And then we found out that Hamlet was playing and we had to see it. And because it just sort of in our minds, like, well, that is the quintessential sort of England theater experience, right? And then when we bought our tickets, they were so remarkably cheap, we couldn't believe it. And then we found out why. It was the understudy performance, where all the understudies play leads and leads play the minor roles. So uh, let's head off to Stratford to hear our thoughts on this most interesting question. Ta-ta! So we're seeing the Royal Shakespeare Company production of Hamlet in Stratford. and Upon uh, Avon. Yes, and what we didn't know when we booked the tickets... Uh, and we should have known, I suppose, because the tickets were only five pounds apiece, is that what we were seeing was an understudy rehearsal. And when we first discovered that, I was a little bit uh, disappointed, but then um, then I quickly realized that we didn't know anybody who was in the cast anyway, so it wasn't very important whether we wouldn't we wouldn't be missing anyone in particular. And kind of how cool it is it, because what other theater company does a public a public um, understudy show. So they ex- there was a uh, curtain speech before the show, and they explained that that this was the one and only time that they do a rehearsal like this. The show is uh, about two months into the run, and um, everyone in the cast that has a lower role understudies obviously other roles in the show. Some understudy more than one role in the show, and this is the one time that they put the whole show together with just. The understudies, but that's not all. The people who play the larger parts, like Hamlet and Ophelia and Polonius, mm-hmm. they had to fill in the lower parts so that those roles would be covered as people people's ranks moved up. So, for example, we saw uh, the the person who plays Hamlet was played the role of the player king, which is probably the small. I don't even think he had any lines. He didn't did he? have any lines. It's the smallest part in the show. But he was very joyful in his in his part. He seemed to be loving it. And uh, I think this. I thought, don't, wouldn't you agree, Craig? This is this was quite a singular experience that we've been having today. Yeah, we're very. I feel so lucky to be here because, and again, as they explained in the show, some of these people will never ever have the opportunity to play these roles again. And then it was kind of cool because it was quite quite like I think it would have been in Shakespeare's time where some people are playing five roles. Mm-hmm. So there's the guy who plays Laertes showed up like five seconds later as Ronaldo, mm-hmm. and uh, Marcellus was you know I've seen him like three times. 
and and we think Claudius was also the ghost. I, I have to look that up. So the one the one exception was that the fellow who was the understudy for Claudius is unfortunately not able to participate today. So that the the, the we, real Claudius was seeing, understudying the understudy for Claudius. And let me tell you, I, I I think that in itself has been a real has been a treat. So so this is the this is the Royal Shakespeare Company, and we're and we're the theater is incredible. Okay, so I'm going to... Can I start? Oh, please, go. Okay, the first thing I want to... Okay, I, I have a lot to say about this show, but... I know, it's fir- intermission, so we're like... and It's been we're like excited. an hour and a half, we're like giddy. But the first thing I want to say is that at... Uh, let's not name any names, but at the professional theater that we managed to see most of our Shakespeare at in Canada, there is a standard accent that they use, mm-hmm. that they're, they're taught, and everyone sounds... Uh, uniformly the same. There's a standard accent there. And everyone here manages... They, they, they just manage to have their own accents, don't they? I there's mean, Hamlet of, is Irish. There's a mix. There's yeah. a total wonderful mix. And there's a mix of, of, of um, common and... Um, and posh, and you can hear in the background they're telling us we have to go back in, but we mm-hmm. wanted to really start this. I think the lighting is incredible. I've never been so intrigued by how someone has used lighting in a show like um one thing that we didn't notice when we came in and sat down is like there was a whole sort there's of a like moat there's the there's the main playing space and then around it is a black moat that in in normal light looks like sort of a, a slate. A, it sort of looks like slate but under the theatrical lighting you can see that there are it's, um, there are skulls, skulls embedded in it yes which um, will come into play later in the second half and i think some, some of the understudies summative. are doing a uh, better job than others i think hamlet the guy who's playing it i don't know if he's just like he was nervous at the beginning cuz he seemed to get he gets the better and better and better i'm finding him really really getting more and more engaged. Well, I think everything. that's the role too, because he starts uh, yeah, off the play very true. confused, doesn't he? He's not, he doesn't know what's happening. He's just dealt with the death of his father. And I'll, I'll tell you this for nothing too. Anybody who says that Shakespeare is, you can't understand it, is really bogus. It's the people who who are saying it that have to understand what they're saying and then to convey it. Okay, we have to go, but the, that we'll was the, thought, I, the, the thought I had at, at during the show was that we need to remove Shakespeare from the English curriculum because it has absolutely no, no place there. No. Thank okay. you. That Bye. is all. <laughs> This is part two of our conversation about the Royal Shakespeare Company's production of Hamlet. We are now in the car, and we're we're motoring down the what is it, the M40. I'm being very careful to stay into my lane, even though I want to drift because I'm not used to driving on the right hand side. Yes, Craig is being a very very conscientious driver, so I'm going to uh, be doing most of the talking. So the first thing I have to say is that. Theater, theater is always a singular experience, right? Every time you go, there's going to be something that's not exactly the way it is the night before and won't be the next night. And I just, I have to say that it, it, it almost had tears in my eyes at the end of the show because, as we said before, this is a this was a public uh, understudy performance. So all of the understudies got to perform. You know, it's quite possible that the guy who played Hamlet will never get to play it again unless something comes up. But at the end of the show, you know, he's lying on the ground, everyone's lying on the ground, the play is over, it ends pretty spectacularly, and the lights come up, and the first thing he does is he starts to laugh. And And it was that laugh where I can't believe I just did that, and and because I thought his performance was quite flawless. There were flubs here and there from some of the other characters, but he was... Dead on. From he was. What I could tell. He was a great Hamlet, and if I had known that he was the understudy, I, I, I never would have known that he no, was the understudy. No, I, I thought he did a really nice job of, of, of strength and weakness. His soliloquies were um, to- engaging, always engaging. Um, I, I really, I, yeah, I really, really enjoyed his performance, and I just, I loved that moment where we got to see his his inner thoughts and then what was so lovely was that then afterwards every actor was clapping him on the back the hamlet who who plays it regularly gave him this huge hug and you just knew that it was you know it was an experience again uh it's it's never going to happen again for this production and and it just so happens that this was the show that we saw um and uh, yes, Craig and I were both like, "Oh, we're seeing understudies," and and now I'm really kind of tickled that we saw understudies. It's it's a, something that we don't ever get to see, mm-hmm. um, and and so I'm really glad that I had this experience. Um, 
I think Hamlet is long. <laughs> so we started the show at one o'clock and we ended at four thirty, and uh, and even they did a, a little bit of trimming, but not a lot. And I'm not really sure it's really necessary to see the whole thing. And this is not anything against the pace of this production, eh, Craig? No, the pace was lovely. It was urgent and important. It was they were moving the play along at a good pace without ever feeling rushed. They weren't afraid to take their their moments where moments were important to be taken. And they weren't afraid to push it a little bit when, you know, things could be pushed a little bit. And, and what really uh, impressed me in terms of theater is that Hamlet is a, even in this cutting, was a three and a half hour play that takes place in, in dozens of locations. And all of this was accomplished without a single blackout, nay, nary without a single pause between scenes. Every time a scene was about to end, the characters for the next scene were coming on. If, a, if scenery had to be moved, uh, it was moved during a scene. In fact, we saw the craziest scene change I've ever seen done live on stage. During a scene, people came in and took up parts, the floor. parts up the floor up then to become the dirt that becomes the, uh, the the graveyard. And this was this was happening while a scene was going on. And you know what? It did not uh, affect the show in any way other than to move it along and keep us in the theater of the moment. We know it's theater. We, we can see the audience. We can see the lights. We, we know there is an artifice when you go see a play. And that's why I'm always so bothered when there's a when there's a blackout used to change some scenery because it's just not important. You're not you're not fooling anyone. You're only interrupting the play. And this was a great example of how you can move a play along without blackouts and the audience the audience just goes with it we're there we're it's a communal experience and we're there and we're we are we're part of it so we're we're willing to go with whatever it is that you you show us and when, when a blackout happens it it interrupts everything it's it's, it's a pause and it, and it lets us start thinking about the real world and what groceries we have to pick up at the end so like i say just keep the play moving and it, it just works beautifully and, and never worry about the audience seeing the mechanics of what's happening. Everybody knows it's theater. And I'll tell you this for nothing. What really amazed me, because let's think about, let's remember, in Shakespeare's time, there was no such thing as the blackout. There it no did lights. not exist. There were no lights. And I was amazed at how often at the end of one scene, whoever the character was talking about was the first speaker in the next scene. Yeah. More often than not, whenever Hamlet was talking, say a good example is Hamlet's talking about Claudius and Claudius comes right on stage and he's in his own moment. He doesn't acknowledge uh, Hamlet. He's in his own world. He's, he's in, in a different his, location. He's in a different location and it just, I just, just flows. I just felt this um, and you get that dramatic irony too. Yes. That that's, yes, that's the person he's talking about. And you see them as he's talking about them. A wonderful goose pimple tickle of theatricality when the person who another character is talking about just walks right by them. And I just thought that was great. Uh, another really interesting theatrical thing that happened in this production was that the character or the actor who played Claudius also played the ghost, which I've never seen and I quite liked. Yeah, it fits just fine. I mean, it, it's a good, it's a, it's a fair double, isn't it? I mean, yeah. they're, they're never on stage at the same time. For no, sure. and in fact, uh, um, well, you know, in Shakespeare's time, the whole thing was played by probably 10, maybe 10, 12 guys at the most. Um, and, uh, the partnerships of characters probably were quite interesting, like Marcellus and Bernardo, who are um, Hamlet's friends, more than likely played Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who are his foes. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was a really interesting thing, too, to see um, these understudies just play the multiple roles. I loved it. I did not love Ophelia. And I don't think that she was in this wonderfully directed production. I, I don't think she was directed well. I think that Ophelia, if she's going to go mad, she we need to see this struggle in her between her love for um, Hamlet, which is overridden by her love and her obedience for her father. And I just didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't get that there was an inner struggle in her when she's handing over the um, the letters. Um, handing over the letters that, that maybe she's not that great an actor and she knows that her, her dad is like, you know, right outside the door. Um, I, uh, I think that's where the anger in, in, in Hamlet lies in that scene. That's why he gets so angry at her when indeed he does, you know, love her. And, but you know, that's my own, that's my own little thing. Is there anything that, uh, you weren't that keen on as a um. final? 
Yeah, that's a good question. No, you I weren't really that keen on. I didn't like Bolognius very much, but uh, I, I, but I think it was more because he wasn't he wasn't as strong on his. Uh, on his he lines. was the his, one. He was the he understudy. Was the who, I felt that he wasn't quite as prepared as the other actors. Yes, it didn't quite come across. Ooh, ooh, I know what I'm going to end on. So we're going to look this up, but I'm pretty sure we we think that um, the guy who really plays Polonius uh, was one of the players and uh, who gives who gives the speech, which I don't quite often see. It gets cut quite a bit, I must assume, um, where he's talking about Hecuba Priam and. Uh, um, He's telling a story for Hamlet, and it is quite an innocuous little speech. It's not, you know, it's purposely not written very well. And he, it was a perfect example of how you can take this little tiny role and you can just, you can cream the stage. He was, he came across as a very, he never said anything out of the speech, never said anything that gave us any indication of intextual wise about what his character was like, but his personality just oozed out of his pores. Um, the way that he stumbled, he was obviously he was obviously a drunk, and that there was just in that moment that just a glimmer of light of the character he of the actor that he used to be when he gave the speech. I just thought it was a, um, I just thought it was a, a star turn performance in this little tiny role. That, yeah, you just got those two lines, right? Those two yep, monologues. That's two it. little monologues. All right, so uh, now we're gonna let Craig uh, continue to drive, and uh, and we're gonna end it there. Say goodbye, Craig. Goodbye, Craig.